Hey everyone, welcome to The Stitchery. I recently got really interested in needle lace, and at first I thought that it was a type of embroidery or an embroidery stitch, like chain stitch, satin stitch, lace stitch. And then one day I was uh, avoiding going to bed by sitting needlessly on the toilet and scrolling through Instagram at 3 a.m. and I discovered Romanian needle lace, which I also thought was another embroidery stitch, like Romanian lace stitch. But I started doing a lot more research. I got very deep in my research that night because I can sleep when I'm dead. And I discovered that I was thinking about this all the wrong way. Needle lace is not a type of embroidery or an embroidery stitch, but rather a form of making lace using a needle and thread. And in retrospect, that feels like a really like duh moment, I know, but I think I get very focused on my own art form sometimes and to think that everything springs from that fountain. So I was really hooked now and I started doing a lot of research and what was going to be just a short little video exploring needle lace and what you can do with it suddenly it turned into this massively long video, so I had to cut it up into two parts. This first part, we are going to look at the basics of needle lace, the different stitches that you can use, how to do it, different ways that you can do it, and different ways that you can kind of blend it in with embroidery. And in my next video, we're going around the world. I found needle lace techniques from a bunch of different countries, and they're all unique and so fascinating. So I'm going to do some explorations of those different kinds, experiments, we're gonna see what comes out of it. Little disclaimer here, I have never done needle lace before and I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. So this should be a lot of fun. For my first attempt at needle lace, I decided to go with the concept I had when I still thought of it all as an embroidery stitch. And here's why I thought that. I've seen and done something called trellis stitch and something called net stitch, which are both basically the same thing. Embroidery stitches that are disconnected from the fabric under them, usually a connecting line of blanket or buttonhole stitches. Now, the first thing you'll discover when researching needle lace, well, actually it was like the seventh thing I discovered is that the most basic stitch used is buttonhole or blanket stitch, also known as single brussel stitch, depending on exactly what style of needle lace you're doing. It's exactly the same thing. So now it makes a little more sense why I thought of all of this as just a specific embroidery stitch rather than a form of lace making. And I wanted to start out by trying each of the basic needle lace fill stitches on their own in a really simple way. So I outlined five little rectangles in back stitch on a hoop. I'm using all six strands of regular DMC embroidery floss here and started with single brussel stitch. To do this one, I'm coming up on the left side of my square with my thread knotted on the back to secure it. Then I'm sliding my needle under the first back stitch up here on top, going through the loop of my working thread just as you would to make a detached blanket stitch. And it's just that motion all the way to the end. I'm not pulling too tight because I want the loops of this row of stitches to extend to the length of one back stitch on the side here once I'm all done. At the right side, I'm sliding my needle under the top back stitch to secure the first row of brussels and start working on the second row in the opposite direction. Now the stitches loop through the first row of stitches and pulling gently is even more important. This continues through the rectangle, securing each row of brussels by going under the back stitches at the sides before starting a new row that loops through the previous one. Oh, and I want to note that now I'm only using three strands of floss because the brussel stitches will be the same size as the length of my back stitches. I made those pretty small, so I want to use a less bulky thread weight so I can still see the holes in the lace and it's not too tightly woven. Once I finish the last row, I am sliding my needle under the first back stitch on the bottom here, then whip stitching the last row of brussels to the bottom outline. I'm still not going through the fabric, just looping my thread under the back stitch and under the brussels continuously to the end. Then I went through the fabric and tied off my thread on the back. I definitely got a little messy on this one when I had to get new lengths of thread. I think I may have gone through the fabric in the wrong place, so I had to touch that up. But overall, it looked pretty good in the end, and it was a pretty simple one to create, though definitely not a quick undertaking. It is a slow stitch. The next stitch I want to try is a double brussels. It's the same motion of that detached blanket stitch, but you basically arrange it differently to get a new pattern. This time I'll go under the first back stitch like normal, under the second like normal, then skip one and go under the fourth. So in the end you get a row with a small loop, large loop, small loop, large loop. 
This one is also worked back and forth, so I'll secure it under the side outline before going back in the other direction. Then I made two loops on each of the big loops up above and skipped the small ones to carry on the same pattern. This one was a little trickier to keep even and I actually ended up skipping back stitches on the sides to continue stretching it out as big as I wanted it to be. Maybe if I had pulled the stitches tighter from the beginning, they would have stayed smaller. But regardless, I really like the end result here and somehow the pattern looks fairly even, so that's good. Now I'm going to try out a corded single Brussels stitch. For this one, you're just doing a regular Brussels stitch across from left to right, and then instead of going back the other direction, you lace the thread under the side outline and go straight back across to the left side, so you have this one long piece of thread across the rectangle. Then you lace it again and restart going left to right, and as you're making each loop or stitch, it's going around that straight piece of floss as well as through the loop. This one was super easy to do and I felt like it stayed more even or perhaps it was just easier to pull to an even size as I went. By the time I got halfway down, there was definitely an upward pulling towards the right as well. You can see here how it's pulling up the further down I go. So it definitely throws you off if you aren't prepared to see that and it can look like you're doing something wrong or you should skip a side stitch. But if you just stick with the pattern and trust it to work, then when you get to the end and whip that last row to the bottom outline, it turns out really well. And you can see how I have bigger holes in the lace towards the lower right corner and much tighter loops towards the upper left corner, which makes a lot of sense with how I stitched it. I rubbed my finger and even my fingernail across it a lot and it actually evened it out really well. Two more stitches to go. You can pretty much add the corded element to any other stitch, like corded double Brussels stitch and so on. So I'm not gonna keep doing that one. Next up, I'm going to try one that I've seen called twisted Brussels stitch, as well as I believe point de Spagna, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Please do correct me in the comments. This one just puts an extra twist in each stitch, which makes the loops kind of longer or just more complex in nature, I guess. I definitely thought this one would be the most even and neat of all the ones I've tried so far until I started the second row. I'm actually not sure I'm adding the twist the proper way, as I saw one example where you create this sort of loop with your working thread and then go over and under it, and that just didn't work for me. It, it, didn't work at all. So instead, I am just doing a regular Brussels stitch, then winding my needle and thread through the loop one more time for that extra twist. As long as I keep the stitch even and straight, it looks pretty much right, but this stitch definitely ended up being the most iffy so far. There was a lot of pulling upwards, I was really unsure if my loops were even at all. Often the loops would completely disappear because they got pulled too tight somehow, and I had to dig through the threads to find the holes in the center. Plus I ended up running out of room on the right before the left, and I'm not sure how that even happened. Once I got the bottom whipped down and sort of evened everything out with my fingernail, it looked a lot better, but this one is going to be something to work on later. Last up for this little expiration is P-stitch, that's P-E-A. This kind of looked the same as double Brussels stitch at first, so I was a little confused, but I guess the difference here is that you are alternating the pattern on each row. So the first row is single Brussels, then the second row skips every other stitch, much like a double Brussels. Then you go back to the single Brussels on the third row, but now you're putting two stitches into each previous loop. I also saw another tutorial that switched the two, so you start with the double Brussels, then do a row of single, but I'm assuming that's the same thing in the end. So this one was actually the most worrying as I stitched it, as in it tended to pucker up, not just pull up towards the middle, but actually turn under itself. So it could be a bit difficult to find the proper holes to be going through as I carried on with the rows. I also think I made the loops a bit too big on this one because by the time I had used all of my outline stitches on the sides, I was practically past the bottom outline with my loops. Once again though, getting it whipped onto the bottom and then evening out the stitches with my fingernail kind of fixed everything. And this is actually my favorite of the five stitch styles now. I love the texture and pattern and it's actually pretty even. Plus, I think the larger holes make it look more complex and more lacy, despite this one being the fastest to sew and taking the least thread. 
And that's it for my first round of practice stitches. Don't they all look so pretty? I'm definitely hooked and ready to try more in this wonderful world of needle lacing. These have all been traditional stitches you may see in a lace like Battenberg, but they would normally be secured on the sides using something like a ribbon tape or a cordonet, which we will go into next. This would allow them to be lifted off the fabric once completed so you actually have a piece of wholly see-through lace, but since I was just starting out with some light stitch practice, using the back stitch outlines and leaving it on the fabric was much easier for me. So now I'm moving on to the wonderful world of coordinates. This is a thread or cord that is doubled up around the outline of a piece of soon-to-be lace. By tacking this outline to a piece of fabric, or several pieces called a sandwich or scaffold, or even a piece of cardboard or paper, you can create lace that lays entirely on top of its backing and then remove that lace by snipping all of those tacking stitches. My research on how to properly lay a coordinate turned up with several methods, but they were all somewhat lacking in detail? probably should have bought some books on the subject, but hey, I'm not claiming to know what I'm talking about here, so I'm just gonna give it my best shot. I have some fabric and a hoop ready to be the backing, and the first thing I need to do is choose a shape for this piece of lace. And because hubris is my downfall, I'm going with a six-petaled flower instead of a basic leaf or something a beginner would normally do. We'll see if this ruins me. Considering how poorly my freehand drawing is going, I don't like the odds. Now I need to tack on doubled up cording or thread or yarn or something to form the outline. I found this gold cord in my messy ribbon drawer and it's actually pretty thick already so I'm once again going to buck the system and not double it up. The question now is where the crap do I start the outline? Most beginner pieces of lace I saw were a single leaf or petal shape, so they had this sort of point at the base where the outline cord could start and end, but I have not provided myself with that luxury, so I'm going to just go for it at the base of this petal. I'm tacking the cord down with two strands of embroidery floss, spacing the tacking stitches evenly as I go. And now we run into our first hurdle. Where do I go from here? I am winging it so hard with this coordinate. All right, so after confusing myself with the first two petals, I just went for it and finally got into a sort of pattern that gave me a doubled up cord on the center circle and the sides of the petals where they touch. Wasn't really sure how to end it, so I just, um, you know, cut it off. How's it look? Any lace experts out there want to rant at my terrible techniques in the comments? I will take any advice you'd like to give. Next, I'm going to start making the actual lace part. A rainbow of variegated thread colors seems appropriate. I might try to do six different stitches, or I might just alternate between single Brussels stitch and corded single Brussels stitch. We will see where the floss takes me. Definitely starting out with a single Brussels though. And now I have a new hurdle to jump. How to secure the thread. You can't go through the fabric, no knots on the back allowed. I'm sure there's some proper way to do this, and I have seen something called a blanket stitch knot used, but I recently saw this lovely way of securing thread on Instagram, so I'm giving it a go. Basically, you thread your needle with the loose ends of a doubled up piece of floss. I'm using two strands doubled up into four, so the loop is on the far end. Then you can draw that under your coordinate at the starting point, bring the needle through the loop, and ta-da, secured. Let's make some lace. So right away, I'm realizing that my tacking stitches should have been closer together if I wanted a fairly tight lace. Since each Brussels stitch ends up being about the size of the space between two tacking stitches, mine are fairly big. That being said, I am really liking this look. For the second petal, I'm going to try out the corded version, and I definitely didn't take the round shape of the petals into consideration. So the straight cord part of this stitch is way below the first set of loops. Not to worry, I carried on as usual, pulling the line and the loops together with my next row of loops, and the pattern turned out looking pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. 
but I do want to see what a tighter lace will look like, so I'm going to try putting two Brussels stitches in each tacking section. That kind of makes it seem like I'm doing double Brussels, but in the end I don't think this qualifies since I'm continuing downward with only one stitch per loop. This is definitely the look I was expecting more when I started, and it instantly doubled the time and the amount of thread needed. But it also ended up being really wonky and crooked and not at all neat. Operator error, I would say. I repeated those same three stitches for the remaining petals and got better or at least a bit cleaner results on this second round. I like the look of this so far. I'm cool with this. The next step is blanket stitching around the entire border. This holds down the lace, covers all the cord, secures it, all that good stuff. So I'm going to do it in white so it's quick and easy to see, and I'll use that same loop method with the two doubled strands of floss to secure the end. So right away I'm realizing this is the hardest part of the entire piece, and my hubris has now come back to bite me, because this looks awful. Okay, so I spent a hefty bit of time off camera finishing all the blanket stitched edging and well, it doesn't look great. Clearly I got better in some areas, like the blue petal I think was my best work. You can see a section here where it's completely filled in properly with no gaps, and that's how all of it should be. But then we go up to the pink petal here and yikes, not so good. I think I definitely could have helped myself out by doing more similar colors. Like I have gold cord, rainbow lacing, and white edging. You can see everything. If you're doing a traditional white on white on white lace, then you won't really notice if a bit of the cording is showing through because it all blends together. Together. So, my own fault there. Also, this shape did not help me. I was very unsure of what path to take around it, which meant a lot of doubling back, going over the same place, or sliding my needle all the way under a bunch of stitches to get to a new spot. And lastly, using a thicker cord was probably not helpful either. It makes the outside edging the most prominent part of this, and you can tell big time where I doubled it up and where I didn't. So, many lessons learned. So many lessons. Time for the last step, removing the lace from the fabric. For this, you just flip it over and snip all the threads. There's a lot in the center. Ooh, that is super satisfying. I like that part. Okay, and it's off. It's free. I have successfully made a super wonky piece of lace. I'm going to use tweezers now to remove all of these little tacking stitches on the back so that it becomes a nice and clean-ish double-sided piece of lace. And there we go. My first coordinate-based piece of lace complete at last. Honestly, now that it's all cleaned up and freestanding, it doesn't look nearly as bad as I thought. If I had started with an easier shape, used a thinner cord, doubled up like everyone said to, and stuck to just one color so it all blended together, this could have been a lot better. But overall, this piece is solid, it's not coming apart, it's lacy, it's fun, and I learned a heck of a lot from making it. What's next? I thought you'd never ask. I'm going to try another coordinate piece, but this time I'm going to use wire instead of cording so that I can bend the finished piece into a shape and it will stand up. This is already a super common technique for 3D embroidery or stump work, but for those methods you typically sew through the fabric rather than keeping your stitches detached as with the needle lace style. I used a 24 gauge wire to form four little wing or petal shapes. I think they're going to be wings. Fairy? Dragonfly? Something like that. I'm using what I learned on the last piece to do this one better, so I used a lot more tacking stitches on this one. I'm also using only one strand of floss doubled over for the lace and the blanket stitch edging. I stuck with a single Brussels stitch on this first one because I still want to perfect that, and I must say it's looking pretty darn good. For my second two wings, I wanted to try out a sort of random blanket stitch method that I've seen on a few pieces. It's just a completely haphazard collection of stitches in all different directions, no pattern or anything.
I love the way it turned out, especially for veiny leaves or really delicate wings. And it was also really fun to turn off my pattern-loving brain and just go for it. And here's the final piece. The wire turned out great, not too heavy or stiff, but still able to support the thread in a raised shape. Since I hadn't planned out what I was going to be doing with these, there's a bit of a mess of wire on the back, but I am absolutely loving this exploration. Definitely planning to do some more of this. So that is where we're stopping for today, because after this I'm planning to get into all sorts of specific needle lace styles from around the world, and that's going to take a while. Come back for the follow-up video if you want to know how they make needle lace in, say, Croatia. And as I mentioned before, I really have no idea what I'm doing here. It's all very new to me, and I've absolutely loved exploring these new styles of creation. I'm definitely planning to learn more about needle lace, get way better at the stitches, and start working it into my embroidery art. If you found needle lace as intriguing as I did, and you'd love to see more specific or informed or thorough tutorials on how to make pieces like these, then let me know in the comments. I would love an excuse to do more research and more practice. Thanks so much for watching. It is a joy to share the new things I learned with you all, and I will We'll see you next time.